Thank you. That was kind. Hello. Welcome to Multisite. Who here has worked with Multisite before? Everybody. So I don't need to be here. Um, who's a beginning developer or thinks of themselves as a beginning developer? An advanced developer or been doing this for a while? Okay. Well, hopefully this should help everybody a little bit. Um, I think the thing I want you to take away from this is how the internals of multi-site work, because I think an awareness of that can help you um, as you're doing things with multi-site. So we're going to start with a little history, um, because I think, well, the history of multi-site dates all the way back to before WordPress. Um, so having that as a context for um, what we're working with can sometimes help. It definitely helps when you're trying to figure out why different decisions were made in multi-site code that we then either use or have to work around. Um, so back in 2003, when Matt and Mike forked uh, B2 into WordPress, there were two other forks at the time, B2 Evolution and B2++. Uh, B2++ is a fork created by Donna Coaquive. Uh, that he used to install B2 for many different users as part of his uh, Linux users forums, blogs.linux.ie. So pretty much the same exact thing where one installation of B2 would power many different sites. Um, when the first version of WordPress was released, Matt reached out to Donica and asked him if he'd like to be a, a core developer with WordPress and asked if we could merge the two projects together. Donica said yes. Um, and B2++ became WordPress MU. So for a few years, uh, WordPress MU development kind of existed here while WordPress was here, and then every time a new WordPress release came out, it would be merged into MU and, um, at some time and, and be distributed. Um, in 2005, WordPress.com started. Matt hired Donica as the first automatic employee, I believe. Um, and then WordPress multi-site kind of really got started. The community grew around multi-site. WordPress.com, of course, being an open blog registration um, for many different users, many different sites. Uh, and then in 2009, Matt announced at the State of the Word that multi-site was going to be merged into WordPress proper. Um, 2010, there's a huge effort, if you ever have hours, uh, ticket 11644 um, is a long ticket to read through on the merge of multi-site. So that's how we got here, um, and now we can get into details. So we're going to walk through four things. They all kind of relate uh, pretty closely. Uh, the structure of multi-site itself and the bootstrap process that kind of helps determine what part of that structure we're using. Um, plugins and themes, how those are loaded. Uh, the context of your code and how it's important to be aware um, what part of multi-site you're in as you work. And then finally, a few common solutions to questions that get asked often by people who are using multi-site for the first time. So WordPress itself is, I think of it as a router of requests. So a request comes in, WordPress routes it to wherever it needs to go. Um, a single post, a post archive, a category archive, you know, something. So it follows this common pattern that a lot of different PHP applications use, where it's index.php kind of controls where things are going to go. So we have a bunch of logic that determines, you know, I receive a request, where does it go? So WordPress multi-site works the same way, but it uses tables to, to also separate these requests. Um, when you install WordPress for the first time, you get a set of 10 tables. Uh, you get posts, options, comments, terms, users. Uh, the second you install WordPress multi-site, the users table become global, and then you get a set of another six tables um, that hold the sites, the networks, and then some registration and sign-up information. Now, at this point, you have a multi-site. Um, it only has one site, but it can be considered a network. The second you add a new site, a new set of eight tables is added for that site, and then again and again and again, and it keeps on going. Um, so you get to the point where at WSU, we have 1,200 sites. There's somewhere around 10,000 tables in the database. Um, WordPress.com, tens of millions of tables in the database. Um, all one installation of WordPress. And then when it receives that request, its job is to figure out, um, first of all, which set of database tables do I use, or what site ID do I use? And then next, what post archive do I bring up, or what category, or, or whatever. Uh, more. 
So this is all figured out based on the site ID, also known as blog ID. So we'll cover some of the naming here in a bit. But by default, the tables will have WP underscore site ID underscore their table name. And the same thing is going to happen with capabilities in the user meta table. So users can have different capabilities per site. So on site two, it would be WP underscore two underscore capabilities. And then I might be a contributor. On site five, I might be an administrator. Um, but you know to look for that WP underscore number underscore capabilities. And same thing happens in the uploads directory. Under sites, every individual site has its own directory um, with its ID number. And then if you're using object caching, the same thing happens with your cache groups. So the ID is part of the key that's built to store the, the information. So the part of the process that determines which ID to use so that we know which tables to use, which cache to use, et cetera, et cetera, um, we think of as the bootstrap. And there's two or three important parts of the bootstrap. So MS settings is loaded by WP settings during the normal WordPress bootstrap part. If you have a custom Sunrise file, that gets processed first. And we'll cover that in a little bit. And then as of 4.6, there's a function that runs MS load current site and network. And its job is to take all of the information it has from this request and determine what network ID to use and what site ID to use um, so that it knows what tables to use for the remaining. So the things it has to figure out first, um, there's two globals in, in WordPress that are important for multi-site. Current site, which contains the current network. This is a great, uh, there's great naming history here. Uh, but a WP network object exists as current site. That contains the ID of the network, and then the ID of the main site, and the domain, and the path of the network. And then similar, for whatever the current site is, there's a current blog object, and that contains a WP site object that you can look at. Um, and that contains the ID of the site, the ID of its network, and its domain and path, and then some other things like archived and spam and deleted. So once you have those, those details figured out, the current blog and current network, then WordPress has pretty much decided where it's going to go, what tables it's going to load. Um, and it can do that in two different ways by default. Um, if you have a subdirectory configuration, then all of the sites on your network have the same domain and different paths. So WordPress makes an assumption there and says, well, we only have to look for the path. Um, so we need to populate the current network first by looking at get network by path, because we know that that network is going to match the domain. And then we can use get site by path to populate the current blog object. So this is all inside that MS load current site and network function. If it's a subdomain configuration, sites can have different domains. They can have different paths. They can kind of exist however they need to exist. Um, so we skip the network detection and go straight to site detection. So we use get site by path, figure out what the site ID is, look at the WP site objects for the network ID, and then populate the rest. And then Sunrise is this kind of magical file that you can make all of these decisions for WordPress before WordPress has a chance. So in sunrise.php, if you populate the current site global and the current blog global, then we'll skip MS load current site and network completely um, and move on. So if you had a network that, say, had three sites, and you know if it's going to be this domain and this path, it's always going to be site one, site two, site three. You can kind of make that decision hard-coded there so you can avoid any kind of database lookups or any kind of cache lookups or anything. So once Bootstrap's complete, we get to plugins and themes. Um, so plugins can be loaded in three different ways with multi-site. You have MU plugins, which also exist in single site. Um, if there's a PHP file in this directory, it's going to load on every page view. Uh, so it'll be active on every side of your network by default. Anything that happens, it's going to run. You have network active plugins. So if you go into the network admin, um, you see the list of plugins there, and you can network activate one. And that means every site on the network is always going to run that plugin. Um, and there's no chance for individual site administrators to turn it off on an individual site level. 
And then site active plugins, if you go into a site's admin on the network, um, activate a plugin, it's active only for that site. Um, by default in multi-site, site administrators don't have the ability to um, activate plugins, but you can turn on that option. So you can kind of manage things where you keep some plugins as network plugins that you network activate because you want them always to be on. And then you provide a set of features to your site administrators where they can choose uh, which plugins they want activated for their sites. And then themes are slightly different because there's still only one theme per site, but there's two ways that they can be kind of enabled. Uh, if you go into the network admin, into themes, you can enable a theme for the entire network. And then if you go in edit the site, you can enable a theme just for, for one site. Um, so that can be helpful at Washington State University where we have one theme um, that we want everybody to have access to, but then if we build out some custom themes for different colleges, we might only want them to have access to it. Site enable themes. So while you're working in WordPress, context is important because it can be, once you start doing some advanced stuff in multi-site, it can be easy to lose track of where you are and to expect different things. Um, switch to blog is a very powerful command. So during a request, when WordPress has decided, I'm using site ID 5, I'm going to use these tables, this cache, all of that, you can say switch to blog in your code, um, switch to blog 6, and immediately it'll start using those database tables instead, um, which is pretty cool. So it stores a current context as a backup, and it says, when I'm ready to go back, I'm going to go back to this site. Um, and then it sets the database context. So it gets the new blog ID or the new site ID, um, sets that all up so it's going to be using the right database tables, uh, sets the right object cache context with that same ID, tries to do some setup of roles. Roles? Roles? There we go. Um, but this can get you in trouble, too, a little bit because while it does try to figure out the roles um, that you have set up for the site, um, it does not change the context of code at all. So if you've loaded up site ID 5, and it has uh, plugin A loaded, and then you use switch to blog to site ID 10, and it does not have that plugin enabled, then you don't necessarily have access to the information that that plugin's um, provided. Actually, the opposite of that. If, uh, if on site ID 10, you have a custom post type registered um, using a plugin, and that custom post type isn't registered on site ID 5, if you use switch to blog to go over to 10, uh, then that custom post type won't be available. Um, so you need to kind of have the awareness that all of the plugins and themes you're used to on one site won't necessarily be there once you use switch to blog. Um, and this comes into play quite a bit with rewrite rules. Um, and rewrite rules in general are kind of tough. A common thing that plugins will do is just generate the rewrite rules um, with switch to blog. And this can be tough. Uh, if you delete the rewrite rules option on the next page request, uh, WordPress will generate the rewrite rules fine and everything will populate. If you delete the option while you're switched and then try to populate it yourself, you're probably going to end up populating the rewrite rules with those of the main site. So I guess the lesson here is just be careful when you're doing rewrite rules. Um, and then restore current blog restores the save context. So at the beginning, when switch to blog starts, it takes a backup and moves that into this global that keeps track of a stack of switch blogs. Restore current blog can be used to go back one level. And then MS, MS is switched will tell you if you are in a switched context. Um, and you can loop through that and say, while MS sw is switched is true, then restore current blog. So if for some reason you switched five blogs deep, you could get back really easily um, and continue. And some other good functions for context uh, to help you figure out where you are in your code is main sites, is main network, uh, get blog details and get current sites. Uh, hopefully, once 4.6 ships in a couple months, we'll have a get site and a get network that will make the naming a little bit easier to figure out. So common requests that 
people often come up to me and others and ask immediately after learning about multi-site. Domain mapping. So this is a popular one because you may want to have authentication controlled on one domain. So say WordPress.com, and you have abc.wordpress.com and xyz.wordpress.com. Um, but then you also, on the front, want something like jeremyfelt.com, and you don't necessarily want to have to worry about logging in again under this domain, um, or with HTTPS, only having to get one wildcard certificate that covers um, a subdomain and not having to worry about the map domains. There's a tool, Mercator, made by HumanMade, um, that's kind of the new nice way to do domain mapping. Um, they refer to it as domain aliasing. So you can set up your, your subdomain on the back end and then have domain aliases on the front end that it maps to. Uh, arbitrary domains and paths is another way to approach that. Uh, by default, WordPress supports this, but it, there's no great UI. So when you add a new site, um, in subdomain configuration, you'll still have to put in a kind of a fake subdomain. And then if you go edit that site in the future, you can put whatever domain and path you want. And then that bootstrap process will automatically figure out, uh, everything out just by default. Uh, we have another ticket open uh, to improve that process in the future, I think. Multiple networks. So once you have multiple sites and you start thinking, maybe I want another network to organize things with. Um, JTRIP, John James Jacoby, has a WP multi-network plugin. Um, and WordPress itself supports multiple networks by default, but it doesn't have a UI for it. So WP multi-network kind of creates the UI. Oh. oh, I broke that. That's all right. Uh oh. Does it work? I have a spare one. Go for it. Well, there's only one more anyway. <laughs> And then the last common one is uh, content syndication. So sure, I can have all these sites, but how do I share content from one site to another? Um, and that can be kind of tough because of the issues, like your code doesn't, isn't always available on other sites. Um, so there's two ways to approach this. The REST API makes it a little easier if you install that plugin. You can use the REST API to request content from other sites on the network. Uh, we're working on a plugin at Washington State University that I'm hoping to have public soon um, that makes that easier. Um, another possibility is to do things like store all of your, your shared content in one site and then pull it out into other sites. Um, and yeah, that's it. 